Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Hadil, as Alan said. Um, I'd like to first of all thank Alan and the Center for Media Studies and Transitional Studies so, um, for inviting me. This was supposed to be just for a classroom. Um, I didn't realize I had to put on heels and talk to a, to a lot of people. Most of these people here are from my high school and from my university. So it's very nice to see these familiar faces. My old French teacher from high school is here also. Um, and um, so what I'll do today is um, we'll talk. Um, what, I, what I will try to do is try to keep it nice and short um, and maybe like just go through what I have today in about a half an hour and then open it up to questions because I always feel like the most, um, well, the most interesting stuff comes out of and the most interesting stories comes out of what you actually want to hear from me um, as a person who's, you know, who's witnessed um, a lot of the events that have captivated the world in the past couple of years. Um, we'll talk about um, what the Arab Spring is it really an Arab Spring? Was it an Arab burp, as I like to call it? Um, I'll go through, you know, how it all started, sort of the middle of it, and then also looking ahead about what now, um, what is next for for the uh, for the Middle East. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how we do our jobs because bringing you the news is a big part of actually even what's happening in the Middle East. Um, and also, um, I'll just touch on like what it's what it's like to be a Canadian covering the news uh, in the Middle East, uh, but also um, a Canadian with an Arab Arab background and what that means for identities. And then we'll open it up to to questions. Uh, yes, I am holding an AK-47 in this picture. Um, the Arab Spring is a term that um, was coined really by the media. Um, in the media, we like to package big, large ideas and events into little words so that we don't have to keep explaining them over and over again. Um, and so the Arab Spring was very, very um, good because it was in the springtime. All the rev revolutions happen in the springtime. The spring also makes you think of an uprising. You're rising up, so it's springing, and also it's Arab. And so this sounds very, very nice and, and clean. And so the, the media has, has since called what's, um, what's happening in the Middle East right now the Arab Spring. Um, I was very lucky that I started covering um, the events starting in Tunisia and then I moved to Egypt. I covered the 18 days in Tahrir uh, in Egypt. Two days after Mubarak fell, I was sent to Bahrain uh, where there was clashes there. After a week and a half in Bahrain, um, Benghazi had fallen and so I was sent to uh, Tunisian, the Tunisian border with Libya in the west because we all expected Tripoli to fall very quickly. We were wrong. Um, after that I went and I covered, for most of last year I covered um, the front lines in Misrata and Benghazi in, um, and then in Sirte and, and, and then Tripoli when it also fell in August. After that I um, received um, a new job. I was tapped on the shoulder uh, by Reuters and offered a job as Libya correspondent and I took that job in March and I moved to Tripoli as um, their correspondent there and since then I have covered the events in, in Libya as well as Aleppo when um, things kind of blew up at the beginning of uh, August. Um, Egypt is probably the country that captivated the world the most in, the, in its revolution last year, its uprising last year. Um, and possibly because of its historical significance. Everyone knows things like the pyramids, the Sphinx. People always want to go visit Egypt. Geographically, it's really, really important because it is um, in the center of... Um, of, uh, of, of the Middle East. It's the only Arab country that has a written peace treatment with Israel, which is a very important ally for um, the West, which is important for us who live here and reading the news um, in, in the Middle East. So Egypt really captivated uh, the world, especially, especially with its sheer numbers. But it all really began in Tunisia. And it began in Tunis, at least for myself. Um, Tun Tunisia's um, revolution started in the um, in the in the rural areas and started to move way before January, even way before we even heard about it. Started to move into the um, into the cities, um, and eventually landed in Tunis by around January. 14th, 15th, and that's when all the journalists started to go in um, to uh, to cover to cover the event. This is a picture I took from um, the the. This was the view of my hotel room in um, in Tunis uh, when I was sent there around June, January. I would say I was sent there like January 10th. I'm very bad with the dates now, but I was sent there in the early January and. Um, 
This was maybe two days after Ben Ali had Ben Ali had um, had fled, had left, and and there was chaos on the streets. Um, every day, close to 8,000 people would take to the streets, and, and this is the main downtown street called Bourdiba, um, and they would start at 8 a.m. and just take you know riot through through until the evening until a curfew was set around 10 p.m. and then they would all go back home. Um, but this is what it looked like every day, and this was a nice little revolution to cover actually because. Tunis is very, very quaint. It's very beautiful. Um, you would sort of cover the revolution and then go take an espresso break um, on the sides. So you see, you, you sort of like, you know, mill around, get the stories, and then go back to the edges where all the cafes were. So it was a very civilized revolution. Um, Unlike we will see Libya, um, and and it was you know it was, it was actually very very nice. It was also something for me as a as a Canadian and as an Arab. It was something um, very eye opening. Um, today, when I go to cover these things, I kind of go do my job, mill around, and then leave. Um, in Tunis, it was my first conflict, I guess that you could call it, and I would just walk down Bourguiba, up and down, up and down, and just like listen um, to what people were talking about. Um, it was the first time in an Arab country that I experienced, or that it, anybody had experienced, um, groups of the public standing around and debating things loudly. Now this is something that you know we really take for granted in Canada, where like you know you have preachers on the street, and you know at Rideau Center you have you know people like giving you crazy leaflets and stuff like that, and that's something that we really take for granted. In Tunisia, particularly, um, it, it, you would get cracked down so badly, people would disappear if you if you said anything that was anti anti government, anti Ben Ali, anti um, you know that was pro opposition, and so. The phenomenon of, of walking down a street and seeing six people stand around debating what they thought democracy meant, or de debating what they thought um, being religious meant, or debating what they thought um, should be the future of their country was something spectacular. Um, and to this day, sort of brings electricity into my body when I think about it because it's just it was it was the beginning of something that the Arab world had never ever ever seen before and it was really really important and as we see today um, it's becoming more of a challenge to do that because the new governments that are taking it are, are, are adopting a lot of the old um, a lot of the old regime um, um, tactics I guess um, so Tunisia was 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 one of the first things to do that in, this is another picture from uh, from my room in in uh, in Tun Tunis. Now, this smoke. Can anybody guess what that is? Well, not you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Tear gas. <laughs> Tear gas. <laughs> It's not smoke, it's not burning, it's not anything like that. It's not fog, it's tear gas. Um, and this would, usually most days, I was lucky this day that I was filing in my room. Usually I'd be in the middle of that. Um, and you would never know when it, when it would come. And um, most, Tunisia and Egypt saw a lot of running away from police when you could see them coming. You could see them pop their, um, their tear gas canisters. You could hear it. Um, afterwards, we could differentiate between when I started covering Libya in the war, you could differentiate between the pop of a, of a tear gas and, and a mortar round, for example. Obviously, they're very different, very, very different, but they sort of have the same kind of pops, and you sort of become an expert, saying, well, no, that's just a tear gas canister. No, that's an AK. Um, sometimes you just, it would take you in complete surprise, and I remember a couple of times in, in Tahrir Square, I had to be um, lifted up and taken into an alleyway by just protesters and sort of taken by the cuff and people having to dab my face with Coca-Cola, which is what um, what can is an antidote to to the tear gas. Um, and then you kind of clear yourself and swear a little bit and then walk off and do your job again. Um, the Arab Spring was a learning experience for me and for everybody who was working there about the important um, relationship between armies and governments. Um, in the Middle East, the armies have always been um, back, background um, entities. Um, they would do things like coups. When Mubarak came, for example, um, he was an army man. And then eventually they started to go back to their bases and they control a lot of the things from behind the scenes. A country like Libya doesn't ha didn't have an army. 
It had something that looked like an army, but then it was really revolutionary guards, which were uh, legions of loyalists that would um, that would use you know like an iron fist basically to uh, to fight wars or to to keep order in the streets. Um, Tunisia Tunisia's army was hailed as something that was um, a savior of the revolution. They never um, they didn't um, beat uh, protesters. They didn't attack anybody with guns, they, and they didn't allow police to beat on them. And that's why they were hailed. And this is a picture from Tunis where people, there were tanks everywhere. And this was the first time I ever saw like live tanks on the streets and they were ready to shoot at any time too. They were all, they were all ammoed. Um, and people would come and sort of pose and like, you know, take pictures with the, with the soldiers who were manning them and put flowers because they were very proud of their, of their army. Um, Egypt was different. Egypt thought that they could trust their army um, and, and the army did come out as, as you know a lot of people do feel like the army is, is a savior of, of the revolution um, but there, there's an other side that criticizes the army and says that they allowed police to, um, to attack even though when they were you know guarding when the army was guarding places like Tahrir for example and the police was tear gassing or beating or, or arresting etc the protesters the army didn't do anything to stop it so there's um, there's a debate about about the armies there. This is a very poignant um, picture for me. In Arabic, um, it says "la khawfa ba'da al which is uh, no fear after today. And it was a graffiti that I took a picture of in Tunis. This is this was very very important in a way. Um, foreshadowed all the revolutions or the, all the uprisings at least that happened in the Middle East, um, and that's because. Everyone started talking about this barrier of fear that was broken in, in the Arab world. Um, this barrier of fear that made people feel like um, they, could, they could go to the streets and they could talk in public and they could make a statement. And there was no fear after today. And you really felt it. You were, sometimes you'd be doing an interview with somebody and they'd be like, you know what, the Mubarak can go to hell and I don't care and we need this and this. And you'd be like, I hope nobody's listening to you because you're going to get arrested and bad things will happen to you after you finish with my interview. Um, but, but really this, this kind of symbolized, um, symbolized the Arab Spring, this idea that there is no fear after today, that we've, we've broken this barrier of fear and we're going um, forward. Meanwhile, back in Tahrir, Everyone, everyone can remember those really, really strong images. Um, this photo was taken. Sorry, every time I cover a war or a conflict, some rebel steals my camera, and so I only have, I only have like a few pictures that I was able to take either from people who gave it to me or like on my BlackBerry. So this was, um, this was February 28th. I left Tunis on the 24th, uh, on the 23rd rather. Was it? Or maybe the 24th. The 24th. And I, um, and uh, before that, I, I had sent an email to my boss, and I said, "Please, nothing is happening in Egypt. I really don't want to go back to Egypt. Can I stay in Tunisia? You know, it's so much more interesting here. Here's like a list of six stories that I can write for you. I don't want to come back to Egypt." And he said, "Get on a plane and get back. It's too busy. We need you back here." And we, and he said, "You know, look. Anyway, there's this protest that's being planned on the 25th. You need to help cover it." And we all kind of said, "Oh God, do we really need to cover this? Egypt never has. Nothing's going to happen in Egypt. We all know that." And for, for a good, on the 25th of January, for a good three hours, we were all like, are you sure there's nothing going on? I'm sure there's nothing going on. Nothing's happening. And then, it all, you know, and then all, we all know what happened on January 25th. Um, so it's a good thing I came back home to, from Tunis. Um, this was on January 28th. On the 25th, I wasn't on the street. I was doing something called Desking Story, which is doing basically all the work from the desk while other reporters on the street. On the 28th, I was sent and I had to cover downtown for Egypt. Um, and this was uh, close to... Um, this, was, this was a picture that we took when... The police and the protesters played a game of cat and mouse for all day, for like about at least ten hours, and we were and being tear gassed and beat up, tear gas beat up, tear gas beat up. Like it was this cat and mouse game. Everyone would go through alleys and then like sort of hide, and the police would leave. They would come back out until the until the police was was pulled out and the army was brought in on January 28th, and um, and people started to sleep in in Tahrir, and that's when we saw the beginning of those 18 days until Mubarak fell. Um, and this was a picture that we took 
took as we started walking towards downtown. So like behind this photo basically was is Tahrir and people started burning um, tires and, and, and rioting, but they never like looted or anything like that. Um, this is another poignant picture for me because we walked through, um, if anybody's been to Egypt, you'll recognize a little bit that this is um, uh, Talat Harb Square, uh, which is a very, very famous square in, uh, in downtown, um, downtown Cairo. If you walk about five minutes this way, you reach Tahrir Square. Um, and somebody in the, in the big riot, we were all running, um, and somebody uh, put out a flag on top of the on top of the statue that says "Atabqa um, Wusta," which means the middle class, and and to me this meant something really strong because it it represented the people who were taking to the streets. Um, for many years, when we were covering the Middle East, people said that it was going to be the slums that um, that would rise. It would be the people who couldn't bring bread to their tables every single day or every night that would rise, and it would be the anger of the lower, lower classes that would set off revolutions. Instead, what we saw was actually the middle class, this middle educated class, uh, people who could read, who could write, who had university degrees but didn't have the right networking, didn't have the right connections, who were oppressed either religiously, who were oppressed intellectually, who were, who, who were almost at a grasp of a dignified life but couldn't do it, who couldn't get there because they didn't have the right connections, they didn't have the right, um, the right position in society. And, so, and, and this is what we saw in, all of, uh, in, in a lot of these places, from Tunisia to Egypt to Libya and, and in Syria. Um, it's, it's an intellectual um, uh, in revolution. It was propelled to the great degrees by the lower classes, but definitely pivoted or propelled by, um, by, uh, by the middle class. This is another picture of Tahrir. By, by the end of January 28th, it was basically just on fire. The, um, the NDP buildings was National Democratic Party. The Mubarak's building was completely on fire. Um, Tahrir Square was, was ablaze. You could smell the smoke um, in the air, but you can, it wasn't just the smoke, it was the tear gas also combined with it. Um, there were people lying on the street. You didn't know if they were dead or not. Um, and then we had, we'd heard that there was a curfew, so we had to run back. The challenge of covering Egypt for me was that I was living in Cairo also at the same time. So after, after filing my stories, 12-hour days, 14-hour days, I had to actually go back and make sure that, you know, that that there was water in my house, or that the electricity was working, um, or that my bills were being paid, or that uh, you know, or that my roommate was fine. Um, so it was it was an added stress that I I didn't feel like in Tunisia where I was just in a hotel and I was able to go back. Um, again, this is a poster that says um, "Leave already, don't um, don't don't um, uh, don't don't involve, yeah, don't involve the don't uh, involve the don't involve the the army, um, because people could sense they could sense that you know the army was was teetering. Was it going to join the revolution? Was it not joining the revolution? Um, and so a lot of people um, were holding up these kinds of signs. Each revolution also had a very specific taste. Um, Tunisia was very passionate, was very intellectual. Um, people are extremely educated in, in, in Tunisia. When I went to cover, there was one day in Tunis where I went to cover um, a protest by people who had come in from Tunis from the rural areas and coming from Egypt where, you know, where usually the, the people in the rural areas can't read or write or have limited intellectual, you know, standards. Um, I, I expected to see the same in Tunis, but in Tunis people from the rural areas were able to to discuss theories of democracy. They had um, excellent English and French. They could speak a third language. Um, and that's because one of the legacies, actually, of Ben Ali was that he had, he had um, taken care of the education. So it was a very passionate, Tunis was very passionate, was very intellectual, was very stimulating. Um, Libya was very chaotic, but very also passionate, very well armed, a um, little crazy at times. Um, Egypt was hilarious. Uh, Egyptians are by nature a funny, um, funny people. Uh, they're able to see the sense of humor in, in the in the worst situations. And um, and they and some of the fun. This is only one picture I have, but they had so many funny um, posters. For example, this guy would hold up a poster saying, "Would you please leave already? My arm's killing me," you know, from from carrying this poster. And other people had one that said, "You know, would you leave already? I need to go get married, or I miss my wife, or I need." to go shower. Um, so it was, it, so Tahrir was, was a delight to cover because you'd see guys walking around with, with 
saucepans on their head, you know, and I'd be like, what are you doing? Be like, oh, you know, in case I get hit by a rock, ha, 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 you know, and he'd had like a pot on his head. You know, he, they didn't take themselves very seriously, but they knew that, you know, that they knew they had a real cause. Um, you know, whereas, whereas Libyans, you know, much more self-righteous, for example, I believe that they had, they had a real cause that they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't laugh at themselves. Egyptians could always do that, and that always made it, made it easier to, to cover. Bahrain is sad. Bahrain, um, what happened is with the, with the Arab Spring, um, people, we all got into this big fury of, of, of optimism. Everyone was like, oh my god, Ben Ali's gone. And then, oh my god, Mubarak is gone. This is amazing. This is going to take the Middle East by storm. And you know, democracy is going to flourish tomorrow. And we're all going to have amazing jobs. And everyone's going to be happy. And so when Bahrain started going, um, you know, I was sent right away. Uh, this is Pearl Square. It's actually a roundabout, but it was called Pearl Square. Um, and uh, and people and and riding on um, the coattails of Tunis and then riding on the coattails of Egypt, Bahrainians also um, also rose. There's there's discrimination there, and so they took they took to the street um, and they took to to this play to the Pearl Square, and it became like a big festival. Basically, you know, they wouldn't leave. They slept there for a couple of days, but the day the night that I arrived. I went to bed, um, I arrived at like 10 p.m., went to bed, and by 3 in the morning I got a phone call from my boss in Cairo actually saying, you need to go to Pearl Square, they've, um, we're hearing that they've, they've stormed it. And so um, my team and I at the time I was working for AP got into a car and drove, and it was um, completely deserted. We saw people getting beat up, there was strong smell of tear gas, um, and the police had come in and just completely destroyed. There were tents and uh, people, you know, flags and that kind of thing. It was completely finished. Um, and and of all of the revolutions that I've covered, the security here was the scariest. Um, first of all, they were they were not Arabs, they were not Bahrainis. They were brought in from a lot of a lot of the police were brought in from countries like uh, Pakistan and India, and they were all uh, most of them were Sunni Muslims who were given um, Bahraini citizenship. A to uh, you know what they say is a to increase the number of Sunnis in the country um, to outnumber um, the Shiites, and also um, you know when 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 you're not actually from the country, you won't um, sympathize. You know the way that the Tunisian police, for example, sympathize with the revolution, with an uprising, and so and so they they just they just destroyed it. Unfortunately, um, a week after the Bahraini events happened, um, unfortunately for Benghazi, for Bahrain, Benghazi fell. The East became free, more or less, in um, in Libya, and all eyes were on Libya. So I was pulled out of Bahrain, and I was taken to uh, to Libya. Um, before I go into Libya, one of the big parts of what we do is, um, as conflict reporters, um, is is hang around hospitals a lot of the time. And a lot of my stories, if you go back to read them, um, actually involves a lot of hanging around hospitals. Um, this is a picture of of an X-ray um, with a piece with a bullet. If you see a little hole, it's a bullet underneath somebody's armpit. I have a bunch of other pictures of, of um, shrapnel and uh, doctors really like, you know, as soon as they know you're a journalist, they bring you and they show you this stuff. And doctors have become more or less spokespeople for these uprisings because they're able to, um, because they're firsthand, they're there, they can also give you the information, what kind of weapons are being used, what kind of injuries that they're seeing. Um, a lot of times, particularly in Libya and, and Syria, when you talk to doctors, they'll tell you that they're seeing injuries that are, you know, they're right to the head or right to the chest. So you know the kind of, and that gives you a detailed account of, of, of the kind of people that are fighting. That means that they're also very, very skilled snipers, for example. Um, and then also the kind of weapons that the other side is using. Um, and it's also very, very harrowing. Um, a big part of, of a conflict reporter is counting bodies. And so um, particularly in Libya or even in Bahrain, you have to go into morgues. You spend a lot of time in morgues and you wait there um, counting bodies. And then you have that account. Um, a lot of, uh, because I work for wires, you also need to be very accurate with that. Because other publications, um, like The Citizen or like uh, The New York Times or other places are depending on us to get those very, very detailed numbers out also. And it also gives you a right account. For example, Libya said that, you know, uh, that, you know, tens of thousands of people had died, but the numbers didn't actually match up when organizations like Reuters or AP or, or uh, Human Rights Watch, et cetera, actually went in and, and counted the bodies. Um, in Libya, a big part of, of my job 
in Tripoli when Tripoli fell was um, visiting hospitals and discovering new bodies and sort of opening, sort of following your nose a lot of times, um, to s following your nose to the stench of dead bodies and opening up rooms and finding rooms sometimes as big as this place um, with just bodies piled up on top of each other. And then after you count them and after you find them, you have to try to figure out what happened to them, because when you f when you find bodies, then there must be a story that's behind them, and um, and then and then that also tells the story of, of the of the entire conflict. Um, so we spent we spent a lot of time in hospitals. Um, Libyan field hospitals were very accessible. Um, after a while, they didn't like us to videotape them because they felt like it was giving too much ammunition to the other side. Um, Egyptian field hospitals were were also easy to access. The most heartbreaking field hospitals or hospitals in general were in Syria, um, where um, they were targeted by Syrian army um, many times. That doctors were afraid to um, treat patients who came in with uh, bullet wounds or shrapnel wounds, etc., because it might mean that they were part of the opposition. And a lot of times, doctors were also um, uh, agents of security, and they would send patients or other doctors who were treating patients of the revolution or the uprising. To to um, to to the security, and so you know sometimes there were no no field hospitals anywhere in in the front lines in uh, in Syria, and they had to in Aleppo at least they had to take them all the way to to Turkey to um, to get um, to get treated. Another thing is um, when people find out that you're a journalist, they would come up to you, they would collect canisters of um, of tear gas or like um, shells of, uh, of bullets. And I mean, we're talking about, even though uh, you know, the Middle East has seen its share of wars, et cetera, the past, I would say, 30 years has been quote unquote peaceful in places like Egypt or Tunisia, et cetera. They haven't really seen wars the way that you know, maybe our, my parents had seen it. And so these are people, young people on the streets who are, who are not familiar with weapons. They're not familiar with things like tear gas, et cetera. And they would bring it to you, and especially if you were working for a foreign agency like Associated Press, which is American, they bring it to you and they say, look, this is what your country is doing, this is what your country is sending us, because it would say made in the USA, for example, on it. Um, and, and they would just collect it. In places like Libya, they would um, they would make, they would collect all the small weapons or RPG heads or whatever and make museums out of them, like as a commemoration of, of, of their story in the, um, in the war. Libya was a whole other ball game. It was, it, this was when I, when I went into, into Libya, um, I became a war reporter, and that was because I was covering war. But also, um, I had to start learning what, what it meant to tell the story of a war. And, and, they're, and they're very similar from story to story to story. Um, you have to start learning things, really basic things like weapons, like ammunition, like army um, positions, what other, you know, um, if they're just rebel brigades, what does, um, who's the commander, where do they come from, telling the stories of the people who are fighting, uh, fighting the, um, fight, fighting on the rebel side. You become, you have to learn how to maneuver yourself um, among the, the rebels. Um, I have the added challenge of being a woman. Um, all of these guys are dudes and they're like real dudes, you know, they're the guys who, who um, you know, are not afraid to die at all, um, who, who you know, don't sometimes, not always know how to use their weapons and are high on testosterone and adrenaline. And, you know, here I am in a ponytail, you know, asking them, you know, like, can you please take me to the front line with you? And so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of challenges to trying to extract what's actually happening. Um, in front lines like Libya, um, this picture was um, a, a souk. Actually, like it's, it was a sh it was a shopping center in Misrata, which arguably saw the worst um, of the fighting in Libya. It was under siege for about five months, and we had to. Um, if you can, I don't know where Misrata is. So Misrata is somewhere here in the in the west, and in Benghazi, we had to take a 19-hour boat ride um, to. Because between Benghazi and Misrata was a pro-Gaddafi town called Sirt, and we couldn't go through it, so we had to go around it in a boat for 19 hours, um, and then and then another 19 hours back out. Um, 
and it was the worst hit uh, and the worst probably you saw the you saw the worst fighting. This is still this is Tripoli Street in uh, in Misrata, and um, a lot of a lot of this still looks the same. Um, they haven't they haven't fixed it up, it, but it got it got really really badly damaged. This is one of those weapons um, museums, uh, which is actually causing the United Nations a lot of headache because. It, this is actually all live. Um, a lot of these, um, you could see like, this is like when it first started um, last year, but now it's grown and it's actually inside a building. Um, and uh, and there's, there's actually live RPG heads, which if they got too hot, they could, they could go off. And the UN has actually gone in and said, "Look, you know, let us help you make a real museum out of this, and maybe like disarm some of this stuff." But they won't. They won't. They won't let them um, because they're they're too proud of the of the stuff that they've that they've collected, and they're also um, it's also proof of um, of what what they had to go through for their liberation or for their freedom. And so, you know, just don't go to Misrata. <laughs> We had to hang out with a lot of rebels a lot of times, and it was really boring a lot of times because you have to wait for front lines to move, and sometimes front lines didn't move, and so we would have hang around checkpoints, and sometimes they like to dress you up and throw you their weapons and be like, "Oh, I'm sure you're scared. Aren't you scared? Here's here's my gun." And so you had to, part of the maneuvering. It was like, "Oh no, I'm not scared. I'll I'll hold your gun," and then you know you get a picture taken. Um, the rebels in Libya were funny in their own way, in that they would have ice cream at front lines, um, and they were never, they never, you know, they never, they used to hang around a lot. There was like, you know, they'd be like, "Oh, we're waiting for NATO to bomb. As soon as NATO bombs, we go through." Um, and so this was actually one of those days we would, you know, we would just hang out with them. They would like lie down on their mattresses, and they were really, really decent guys. These guys were from Misrata, and they were waiting to go through into Tripoli from from the east, um, and they're very decent, very very decent people they, but you know they would just like hang out with like you know chains of like ammunition around their necks you know pretend fighting um, so it, it was actually kind of dangerous in a very different way um, this is a this is the picture of a fist um, in in Babel Azizia in, um, in in Tripoli. Um, Babel Azizia was a very very huge compound um, where Gaddafi basically played and 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 lived. Um, and um, he had and Reagan actually bombed um, his house in Babel Azizia in the 80s. Um, and uh, and he he never touched it. Like the building is still there. I mean now I guess it's finished, but it was still up there for a while. And so he had and Gaddafi so uh, to commemorate you know his survival. Um, created this like golden fist made of iron or something and so it's a fist and this part here is uh, an American jet sort of crushing it and the first thing that the Misratis did when they when they stormed Baba Azizia was grab it and go end of my stint in, in triple Libya I went back and my friends threw me a surprise party I put Gaddafi's face on a piece of cake uh, Syria was even worse than Libya. Syria, I had just come. I've just come out of there. I spent um, about the fifth of August to the last day of August. I was in Syria for 17 days. Um, this is, you know, we did not laugh once when I was in Syria. It was a very, very, very harrowing experience. It was some of the most difficult images that I've ever seen. The most difficult um, experiences that I've been through. Um, and even coming back out and wondering, I don't know if I would have done it again. Again. Um, but even though we, I got some of the best stories of my career probably out of Aleppo. Um, I was lucky that um, I got a call out of the blue from my boss who really needed an Arabic speaker to go in and I was available at the time. Will you go? Sure, no problem. Booked a flight to Beirut and then booked a flight to Turkey and we had to, we smuggled through um, from Turkey into Aleppo, into um, just just in the in the rural in rural Aleppo was under was under was was under rebel control at the time. Um, uh, going in, I didn't really know the story at all because um, because I wasn't covering it. I was too busy covering Libya and Egypt for the whole time. Syria was uh, just technically it was part of the Beirut bureaus, um, and so I you know I was never involved in it. But now I had to learn it really quickly, and that's part of our job is to become experts all of a sudden overnight with a story. Um, uh, it was 
Aleppo was difficult because um, I, I was saying I was lucky because I was the only journalist at one point over there. There was myself and the Guardian had um, the Guardian had one person. Um, I think there was another freelancer who was writing, um, and then the AFP and uh, was was using was using local fixers. But as a foreign correspondent, I was probably the only one who was going in right into the front lines, and so we were able to give a very vivid account of how the fighting is being done, and and that's part of telling the story of these revolutions or these wars is how are people fighting um, you know it's it's not enough to just say well the rebels have pushed this far how have they pushed and this is one picture that that one of you know, the star photographer who was with me his name is Goran he has done every war on earth since Kosovo um, took a picture of us part when we were in Aleppo they were trying to fight for a, for a district called Salah al in, 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 in central Aleppo. Um, and um, it was filled with, with, snipe, with snipers of, um, from, uh, from the Syrian army. And, um, and so what, what the rebels had to do is a very, very typical um, guerrilla warfare um, tactic, and that's to um, dig holes into buildings. Um, and, and you had to go, th and so through, so the alleyways are filled with, um, with, with snipers, you have to go through the buildings and go up into into people's homes, and that's how you're able to uh, uh, to fight them. Lots of hanging out with rebels and like shooting um, the shoot with uh, with people. Um, they were like really really regular people. This is Abu Ahmed. I think he used to be a tea smuggler. Um, another guy. These guys. One was a baker. Another guy was a mechanic. Um, and you know they're just really regular, nice guys who would you know who who really held your life every time you went to the front line and back. And you had to trust them with your life. Um, and you had to make a decision whether or not you know they were sane enough at that time. Um, if they were, if 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 you know, if they could take you up or down from the front line, uh, we were taking. That's my security advisor and I. We were just waiting because we actually got lost, and we were like, we don't know where we're going. So they brought us to this base. Um, Abu Ahmed, who's on the on the phone, he was the um, he was the rebel commander of this small brigade that was staying in this place. So he was trying to find us a find us a car. Um, this this photo matches the one at the beginning. Um, we had to, uh, we had to, you know, to get to to get to the front lines. We had to like climb up and down buildings, um, and um, and then and then and then go through the holes that they had buried uh, that had um, foraged through the buildings. Um, so what now? Um, people. There was this honeymoon period right after uh, Mubarak and Gaddafi died. Mubarak had fallen, etc. That you know, um, Arabs really. I mean, even even in Egypt, even in Cairo, when you know I was off, and you would go to get a tea or get a coffee or something. People who worked in who were you know who worked in cafes or just regular people became so politicized. It was the first time in the Arab world that people were talking about politics. The regular guy, the taxi driver, was talking about politics in a very nuanced way, and that's because everyone was talking about what was happening in, in the country. And people started reading and people started um, questioning more. And there was this really great pride in what Egypt had gone through, uh, what Libya had gone through, what what Tunisia had gone through, um, and which has now sort of come come to a lull. People are still proud of those moments, but there's a lot of talk about um, people, you know, either the army hijacking their revolution or, um, you know, certain hardline groups hijacking their revolutions. Um, that that it's not going the right way. There's a lot of. Um, a lot of people who, who uh, if anybody understands Arabic, they call them Hezb Kanaba, which is like the the pol polit um, party of the couch, which means people who are like, you know what, okay, so Mubarak is gone, can we just go back to our life now? You know, we just want stability, we just want, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to bother ourselves with all of this. Why do we have to go to protest again? Do we have to, there's a lot of like, it, there's no, there's this, Lack of of understanding that a revolution is a process and a journey, and it's not something that just happens with like the, you know, the stepping down of one of one leader. Uh, that it's a it's a long. So there's a there's a, a bit of a problem with patience and perseverance. Um, there's lots of things, you know, lots of talk. Uh, of, of the struggle between the Islamists and liberals. Like I said at the beginning of the talk, again, the word Islamist and liberal and nice words that the media likes to use in order to explain really large, nuanced ideas. But these are the words that we use. Um, political, religious people who are 
politicized, like the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, all of a sudden the tables have completely turned. And now, you know, before the revolutions, I used to cover um, court. Uh, the, one, one of the biggest um, Muslim Brotherhood leaders in, in Egypt, Khairat al-Shadr, I used to cover his, his uh, hearings in court when he was uh, sentenced to life in prison and now he is you know somebody who people are begging for interviews because he is basically you know the the mastermind behind the muslim brotherhood and thus the government in egypt um, the liberals the the lack of unity between the people who call themselves liberals or call themselves democrats in places like egypt or or um, or libya and where where do they see themselves are they getting too too bored too tired of the political uh, party and also of course as we've seen last year the the rise and the power of, of hardline um, conservative groups um, like the Salafis. Um, they, uh, they, in places like Libya, they're extremely well armed and they're on a mission. Um, and in places like Tunisia, where they have done campaigns of going into hotels or going into bars, uh, going to, um, to art, uh, art exhibitions, etc., and, um, and sort of destroying them because they believe um, you know, that's, that's their way of life. Um, bringing you the news is, is an important um, part of it also. Um, a lot of times we don't even know what's going on and we have, all we hear is um, things from Twitter and Facebook actually. We'll hear rumors, a person will tweet something and then you know, I'll get a call from London saying, hey Twitter is saying that uh, somebody has died, can you check it? And you know, usually, most of the time it's wrong, but a lot of my job is debunking rumors, especially in the age of, of Twitter and Facebook, and everybody has Twitter and Facebook. Um, and so um, the, the impact of the news, I think, is important because um, it's really, really cool that the kind of stuff that I write, for example, uh, I know gets read in places like the White House. Um, you know, a friend of mine told me that that one of my articles about um, about what happened in Benghazi was being read by by the Obama camp um, and was being followed and being cited. So it's you know it's really good that you know your your articles and your name is being read in places that make decisions, um, and you know that's really difficult to like to give up. Um, uh, how how the news gets out, um, you know, obviously it gets out through newspapers. I don't know why I put that there. Uh, <laughs> Um, Twitter and Facebook is really also important because um, it also uh, has a lot of security concerns for us. Um, in in Misrata, uh, a picture of myself was posted on Facebook um, claiming that I was a uh, Muammar Gaddafi uh, agent and um, I, was covering, uh, I was covering the war for Gaddafi and that they should arrest me and there was a little mob that, that sort of was looking for me and on the CERT front line and I had to flee and I had to get out of Libya eventually. Um, yeah, it wasn't funny at the time, really. <laughs> um, it, was, um, it was very, very scary. And also, my Twitter account was hacked about five times um, by impersonators. They would use an, a capital I instead of an L in my, in my Twitter handle uh, to make it sound like me and just like copied and pasted my picture. And it would put things like, everything is peaceful in Tripoli. Nothing is happening. You know? And so it would either, it, so the person, the person who was doing that was either um, pro-Gaddafi and was trying to get me in trouble with the rebels or was anti-Gaddafi and hated my coverage because I was critical of both sides and, um, and also wanted to get me in trouble with rebels. Um, um, so, you know, taking those into account. So there are many times, for example, in Aleppo where I didn't tweet for like, for days. And part of that was because I didn't want the army to know that I was there, that if, you know, if they could see my byline from, from the papers, that was enough, but I didn't want them to know exactly where I was. Um, and finally, the, okay. Finally, the industry um, is getting worse and worse, <laughs> unfortunately, for journalism students in the room. Um, it's running out of money really quickly. They're putting a lot more pressure on people like me to bring news that is accurate and fast and exclusive and innovative and creative, etc. But they're not paying us more money for it. They're not giving us a lot of aid. I'm lucky because Reuters gives security advisors um, to cover their backsides for insurance purposes. Um, 
but in AP I would be sent into these places without any security advice um, and usually you'd have to like just sort of like trust your, your instincts and they do this because of budget cuts and they do this because they just are running out of money and because big papers um, are also running out of money they're starting to use a lot of young freelancers who are really willing to um, risk themselves because if you go to these places you know you have a name you're, you're in somewhere that's really exciting you're chasing adrenaline you're also chasing a really big story you're chasing something that's really important people are listening to but also with that um, comes a very high risk it's really sad to see the, the industry kind of really crumbling from the inside um, and still you're still getting really quality as much as possible quality reporting and that's because at least in the Middle East the people that I know are reporting there are, are just really really good journalists and have very good consciousness um, TGIC is something I say, call, t thank goodness I'm Canadian. Um, every time I go into one of these places, I make a small prayer for my father for, um, for the great decision that he's made um, when I was 14 to pack us all up and, send it, and bring us to Canada. Um, no matter what, the, no matter what the, the challenges we had here growing up here or the culture, shocks or the arguments that we've had you know about whether or not we should have come here it was it was the best decision and i think any other family from immigrant you know immigrant family in this in this room would share that if if you've seen the kind of things that i've seen um, um, it, it makes my work, I mean, professionally, it makes my work easier. The reason I was able to go to Tunis and Bahrain, et cetera, was because I had a Canadian passport. I don't need to, I won't be questioned like, I, like an American does in a lot of places. Um, I blend in very easily, um, you know, with, with my Canadian passport. I don't need, you know, it just makes it much easier to work in. But it also, um, you always have Canada to come back to, to like, um, you know, wake up in Canada where there's like no sounds and it's, you can sleep really nicely. And I spent an hour at Sobeys to get today just like looking at the red peppers and how nice and clean they are and how like everything is just really, really, really nice. Um, what, what is disappointing about being Canadian is the fact that there's like very little impact that Canada has done on these stories that I've covered in the past two years. And it's, it's disappointing. They're, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there has been a time, um, you know, particularly when we were much younger, when I was in high school, you know, where Canada did have a big impact, even if it was peacekeeping or, or uh, you know, something that they said at the United Nations that made a, that made a wave. Um, and then unfortunately now, if they're not making any decisions, they're making decisions that just, you know, unfortunately, you know, are questionable, um, and and I would have liked that there would have you know just as a Canadian it was always nice to know if there was you know something stronger that Canada had done. But sometimes it's probably a better thing for Canada not to do anything. So that, you know for myself it's it's safer usually. Um, but um, and then wherever I've been, all of the rebels will come to you at one point and ask if they can either. Um, how they can come to Canada. Um, it doesn't matter how strongly they believe in their cause, they still want a visa to Canada. And there have been many times in Syria and Libya particularly where they've actually found internet printed immigration Canada papers and asked me to help them fill them out. Um, so be very lucky that you're Canadian. Um, that's it. Um, in Syria, uh, with the um, likely fall of Assad at some point, uh, will we be seeing the same kind of um, ethnic and religious uh, uh, problems that occurred next door, next door in Iraq? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'd never reported on this, but because it was a difficult story to get to, um, but when you were talking to to the rebels on on the front lines, they hated Sh Shiite. They were very, 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 um, very uh, what's the word sectarian. And even if they they weren't before the war started, the war made sure that they were sectarian. Um, and I I just from what I saw. I think definitely you'll see a lot of sectarian problems. There are entire um, neighborhoods in Aleppo, at least, that are 
that are Christian, for example, or Armenian or Kurdish, and now uh, and the, the Syrian army has made a point of arming these neighborhoods, um, saying that you know to protect yourselves from these terrorists, um, that you should uh, you should set up your own public uh, checkpoints, for example, and and here's here's some weapons for you also, um, and this and this causes more tension between um, the majority Sunni rebels and and these um, and the other side. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't be very I would be very surprised if it didn't happen. This is just my from what I've seen. Stories has been. Um the role, the, the behind the scenes role played by countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar, uh, including uh, military intervention, as far as I know, in, in places like Bahrain, and supplying arms in places like Syria. So what, what do you have to offer on that? Um, I, I, I would actually say that it's not as un, under-reported as you'd think. Um, there have been quite few, it, the, the reason it's probably not as huge is because it's so hard to get information from places like Saudi Arabia or Qatar. They're in, like, it's just, it took me months, you know what I mean, to get a meeting with, with a minister from, from, from Doha. Um, but, but it's not as under, under, underreported as, as you would think, and it's very, very important. I mean, we, I know for sure um, that we saw in Libya um, Doha, uh, Qatari special forces on the ground in Benghazi. And then later, one of the leaders of the Tripoli forces, uh, Abdul Hakim Belhaj, in an interview with me, said, you know, we thank Qatar for all of the blood that it spilled in, in Libya. So it's, it's, it's an open secret that, um, that Doha definitely funded a lot of these places and continues to fund. Um, and also Saudi Arabia, definitely. Um, the, the, the rise of, um, there's many, um, in Syria, for example, there are, um, there are the regular uh, rebel brigades who are made up of um, Syrians, uh, Syrian, you know, Syrian civilians who are now, now taken up arms. And then there are very strong contingents of what they call themselves, or what the media likes to call them, jihadi groups. And they are hardline conservative Muslims from, and I saw them from countries, especially like Libya, uh, Chechnya, there are some Turks. Um, and they are completely funded by places like Saudi Arabia. Maybe not the government, but by rich people who, are, who live there. And that's not a, that's a, that's a, that's an open secret. Okay. Hi, Adil. Um, a lot of other war correspondents have written about how they become almost sort of addicted to, to the adrenaline of, of conflict. Do you find that yourself? And how do you feel when you come back to Canada? Is it sort of, like, I'm sure it's great at, at first, but after a while, does it get sort of boring, sort of? Yeah. Um, that's why I only stay here for two weeks. <laughs> Because then you start fighting with your family about who's going to get the car. And, um, I don't know. I don't. Somebody asked me that before, and I don't. I don't feel addicted to it. I do get an adrenaline high, and you get really um, excited and very, very awake. And I don't need to sleep for a very long time, especially after I come back out of, of a conflict. And especially when you do a really good story, and then you get praise from your bosses, and you know that people are reading it, and then you just want to keep going and going. Um, but I don't know if I'm addicted to it. Like I don't like. It's hard. I definitely, after like a few months of not being in a conflict zone, I feel like, oh, okay, maybe I'm ready for some from excitement. Um, but then as soon as I go back in, I'm like, what the heck did I do? This is like too much, and I want to leave again. And that's what happened in Syria. I was just totally exhausted uh, by the end of my 17 days. I like it a lot, though. I like it because it's it's it is exciting, and you're seeing something so close, um, and you know. So you can't. I don't know if I. I don't know if that's an addiction. Maybe it is. I don't know. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. But um, I like being in Canada because um, sometimes, sometimes when I come to Canada from these conflict zones, I I've had two different reactions. My first reaction is usually anger at people here because they're so oblivious. Um, especially when I come back from countries where I've seen babies being pulled out of rubble, um, or you know, when I've had to like count dozens of bodies in in hospitals. Um, and then I come here and people are like, oh, my mocha is really lukewarm, you know? And then that really, really, really bothers me. Or like the top news is like unpaid parking tickets at McDonald's. Um, and that, that, that does irritate me. Um, this time around, I'm really, I'm really happy to be out because it was, it was just a really long eight week stint. And so I'm really happy to, you know, just to, to go to the mall and go to the Gap. That's nice. It will get boring after a while though.
I'm sure you want to provide a balanced story. But how do you reconcile that with the need to rely on rebels to get you to the front line? And were you ever, you talked about that mob that uh, was looking for you in Libya. Were you ever afraid that rebels would read your stories and then, you know, um, hmm. Retaliate in some way, and they did, and that's one of the. That's the reason that they put my Facebook. They put my picture on Facebook is because I had written a story about rebels looting uh, pro Gaddafi homes, and I, I saw them. You know what I mean? There's, I wrote about it. Um, in retrospect, what I should have done, and what I do now, is when I'm writing stories that are critical of rebels, um, I wait until I leave the country, and so. <laughs> No, really. That's what. That's like a strategy. Um, that, that's what you do. I mean, unless it's breaking, uh, breaking news, then then I would then I would put it out. Um, but otherwise, uh, what you do is you collect a really good amount of, of information about. Oh, really? You that, really you do that? Hmm, that's really interesting. And you know, you really you torture people, and then you, and then you and then you do it when you leave. Um, uh, sometimes what you do is you try. You also forge really. I mean, not all the rebels have the same. Um, um, you know, viewpoint. There's going to be people within them that are self-critical also. And those are the people you also keep as allies and you get quotes from them and stuff and they can also protect you. Um, but yeah, definitely you, you have to be very careful. There was, in, in, in Aleppo there were many times where, you know, I couldn't, we would sleep in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in one of the bases of the rebels in Aleppo. Um, it was in a school and they had used the basement of the school as a prison. And this this rebel group was really nice to us. You know, they would feed us in the evenings. They would take us to the front lines. They helped us do our job, but they also beat the crap out of their prisoners in such, you know, with 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 electrical uh, wires, um, just the same stuff that that they had seen done to them from the army and from the Assad government. They were doing to these people, um, and and I just would have to just hold my ears and and just just bear it. Uh, until you know, until I left, and I could be like, "Oh yeah, they totally did that." Uh, one or two uh, related questions: In which direction is the Arab Spring headed, uh, if any? Uh, where the reason I ask is when I look at the news at, uh, in the evening, what I'm struck by, or news out of the Middle East, what I'm struck by, is the fact that these so-called revolutions, and I think the word itself is very tenuous, mm -hmm. uh, are directionless. Mm -hmm. leaderless, organizationless, and don't have, to the best of my knowledge, mm -hmm. a public economic uh, program. So where are they going? Mm -hmm. uh, the second question I have is what policy is the U.S. following in the Middle East uh, with respect to the uh, newly emerging uh, uh, countries that have experienced the Arab Spring? Your first question is very, is very like spot on, you know, and that's that's what a lot of Arabs are also asking themselves. I would imagine, you know, like I I, I know, um, and this is this is this kind of lull that came after the honeymoon period that I was talking about, where everyone was really proud of what they did, but now they're like, okay, now what? Um, and and this. And, and that's why, and that's the argument why a lot of people would say um, that governments, that, that people have voted in, for example, um, Morsi in Egypt, who comes from the Muslim Brotherhood. That's the only real opposition that has some sort of vision um, for the country, and that's what they've latched onto. And it's also not the regime. Um, and 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 that's one of the that's a big reason why even secularists um, voted for Morsi at the time. Um, where is it going? Sometimes it feels like we can't we can't even predict. And part of my job as a journalist is to predict or be able to show trends. Um, and right now, even we're sort of playing it by ear. Um, you know, sometimes we'll wake up and, and the army in Egypt will have given us like some sort of crazy. Um, you know, the press release, um, uh, you know, that they have moved, they have shuffled people around and you really don't even know why. Um, I think what, what is true, and this also blends in the United States question, is that everyone is fumbling to some degree. Nobody really expected this to come out of the Arab world, um, however much people were theorizing about it, and it's happened so soon. And so, um, and so you hear things like the United States coming out, you know, Obama saying, "Well, you know, Egypt is not an ally, you know, but it's not an enemy, um, and we'll see where it goes." And, I'm, and I don't, I don't, I don't think that he's bluffing that much with that. I think he really means it. That you know, we'll see, we'll see where where stuff was going. But you can definitely tell where the United States is going with Libya, for example. If it, if it was any other country that a, the U.S. ambassador had been died in such a way, 
they would not, and it's election time, they would not have taken the kind of easy, you know, you know, but Libyans came out and helped us when the guy died kind of rhetoric. You know, they would have been much stronger um, and harsher um, than, than what we have heard. And that's because there's lots of oil in Libya. There's lots of business contracts and they're in the middle of signing these contracts and they're not going to let it go over an incident. Well, I travel to the back of the room. Can you tell us the story of this picture? Oh, sure. This was actually in the front line of Aleppo in, um, in Salahuddin district before it was taken over by, by the Syrian army. Um, the, the guy on this side here, he's our security advisor, Steve. He's an ex-military um, sniper, actually, from, from Ireland, who now works for Reuters as a security advisor. Um, the guy who's holding my arm is, um, uh, his name is Abu Furat, and he's a, a Syrian rebel leader um, who's a defector. He defected from the Syrian army just six months before I met him. Um, he used to lead a, a brigade of tanks in the Syrian army, and now he was leading a bunch of guys. Um, on the uh, on the front line, and what we're doing here is actually um, the way that the the way that um, this, this district was was made is like is is very. It's very, very tight, um, narrow alleyways. So there's a building, an alleyway, a building, an alleyway. And we had to cross this alleyway from one building to the other. And at the end of this alleyway were snipers from the Syrian army. And so you had to sort of go get ready, set, go, and then just run across this alleyway to get from one, from one end to the other. And that's basically what we're doing. So we're kind of cringing because there's a rebel shooting, uh, sort of covering us as we ran. So he was shooting very loudly and we would have to we had to just run uh, think of death that it's a possibility that your next trip will be your last trip and following on from that i wanted to ask what you think about won't it won't life be easier for you and for writers for and for everybody else if writers recruited locals from syria from libya from egypt to cover these conflicts mm -hmm. instead of flying you in there to cover these that's a good question, and and I'll do the death bit later. But um, the the Reuters, <laughs> the Reuters, the Reuters uh, do do hire a lot of locals actually, um, and and a lot of these places do a lot of agencies do hire a lot of locals. Um, Syria is very Syria places like Syria and Libya are actually very very unique because um, just you can't get a visa to these places. Um, Libya was, was, was unknown to the world until Gaddafi fell. Um, and so you had to send international reporters in there because there were, you couldn't go in uh, and, and, and find locals and find you know, people that, that could work for you. It was almost impossible. You couldn't open up a bureau in these places, like in Syria and Libya. And in fact, in Syria, we do have locals. But in the front lines, you know, what are you going to do, like hire, hire a rebel? You know, you can't you can't really do that. Um, another another thing is, um, and this you know may sound bad, but um, somebody like me has been trained the Reuters way, for example, or the AP way. Um, we know the kinds of things that a North American audience is writing. Because at the end of the day, I'm I'm not writing for um, a Syrian audience. I'm writing for um, a North American Western audience, and for Reuters, more of an international audience. So I'm trained to, to write that way. I'm trying I'm trained to find that those kind of stories, um, and and that's why they send. Perhaps I'm international, but I'm fluent in Arabic and I speak the Syrian dialect. Um, so it's as close as they can get to sending a local in. Um, that's that's the best answer that I can give you. Whether or not I think about death after that, definitely. You know, after I get to the other side, I'm like, what am I doing? Um, you know, why why am I doing this? But then that feeling goes away really quickly, <laughs> and then you know you just have to go on. Um, there are definitely moments, you know, when, when, for example, that that moment when we were in the front line in those buildings, I came out and that really shook me because um, the building that I was in also was hit by a tank, and you could just hear the hissing of all of the smoke and these, you know, the the electrical poles were falling and stuff like that, and you're like, you know, is, this is this is not necessary, um, and so I didn't go back to the front line after that, but. You know, you, you don't think that today is going to be my last day. You go in saying, okay, I, I don't plan on dying. Um, and then you try your best not to die. And hopefully you don't die. I was curious to know whether in any of the countries that you were in, while things were 
unsettled and it wasn't clear where things were going to go, how often you saw local media and local reporters ever take risks in the things they published, and and um, you know, especially when the government was still in place and it wasn't clear whether it was going to fall yet. I feel like that. I'm, I guess I'm most I'm especially curious about Egypt, but in any country, how often you saw local media and local reporters publish things that took a risk, and I'm also curious. Um, how often you interacted with anyone from Al Jazeera, which I think, you know, is is kind of a interesting case, just because they're still in a significant way um, a part of the government in Qatar. Um, definitely, like especially in Egypt, you saw a lot of risk taking in their in their media. But Egypt has a very rich culture of of opposition papers and um, and intellectuals, you know, writing very strong things in 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 their in their media. And um, just until the revolution started, there was um, cases against um, um, a journalist called Ibrahim Isa, for example, who had just discussed the health of Mubarak. Um, so definitely, I, we saw that all the time, and we would take our own ideas from the local media. A lot of the stuff that we write about is always inspired from local media, from local journalists, because they're the ones who always take the acts. I mean, I have the, the privilege and the and, and the luxury of writing in English, which you know a lot of times governments will ignore, and they'll say, well, it's only going to be written in English. Um, but they're the ones who really are on the front lines intellectually and and in you know journalistically because they put their they really put themselves on the line with a lot of with a, with a lot of their writing. Um, in terms of, I have lots of really good friends who work for Al Jazeera, so we, we were with them on the front lines all the time. Um, in Libya, particularly, they get like celebrity status. Um, if I want to be able to secure an interview in a very chaotic place, I'd be like, I work for Reuters, we sell to Al Jazeera. Um, and then you get golden treatment um, because Al Jazeera is, is, is like God in, in, in places like Libya, particularly, um, Egypt, um, Syria, not so much. Uh, Bahrain, not at all. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely, they get they get a lot of access. They get a lot of work. But they're also a very hardworking organization. The English, particularly, is very very good, um, and so is the Arabic. They get they break a lot of news. They have really a lot of good contacts, and they have a lot of money. Um, I just want to say what a what an incredible inspiration you are to young journalism students, and I was wondering if you have any advice for students who want to become foreign correspondents or war correspondents or such. Sure, um, learn another language. <laughs> um, if you want to, if you want to go to the Middle East, learn Arabic, um, and take the time to learn Arabic. Um, um, and then also, I don't know, I just wouldn't be, a f don't, um, you're always, you, there's always going to be a time where you're worried about jobs and about money and about saving money and that kind of thing. And um, for some reason, I never worried about it. I was always like, oh, I'll figure it out at some point. Uh, now is the time where I'm starting to figure it out. You know, I'm 32. Um, but I moved to the Middle East when I was 26, which is actually relatively old for a lot of the freelancers who've, who've gone. Um, so I, if, if, if that's, if if that's one of the reasons that you're worried about picking up and going somewhere and starting something new, then I would put that out of your head. Like, just just go. Just go and do it. Um, learn. And one of the best pieces of advice that I got was from a foreign correspondent at CBC, and he told me, just go and try it out. Maybe maybe you can't handle life without Tim Hortons. Maybe you do need to come back. You know, at least you just try it out. And, and it's not for everybody. And if, if you realize that it's not for you, it doesn't mean that you can't be a good journalist. It just means that, you know, living in, living somewhere that's not home is, is not for you. So I don't know, learn another language, be very, very persistent, be ready to hustle, um, and, and, and be very, very annoying to a lot of editors.